I hope you're all having good mornings. And um, I'm going to assume that some of you good people here today may have gone into an exhibition that was on display uh, in Dublin Castle from December until March last year, uh, an exhibition on the centenary of the Anglo-Irish Treaty. Now, my name is John Gibney, and I'm the assistant editor of one of the Academy's research projects, Document in Irish Foreign Policy. And I want to talk to you about that exhibition, and hopefully I'll jolt you, wake you up with a good dose of history this morning, because history is what this particular project deals in. What we do is we produce the archival records of Irish foreign policy since 1919. But in line with, what, with what Senator Byrne said, we do place a great emphasis on outreach. Not only do we produce our scholarly editions, but you have to reach out to you know, engage with an audience, to explain material to them, to present it to them. And every now and again, alongside the core task that we do, which is producing um, the handsome green volumes, you'll, some of which you'll see outside, and which would make a perfect Christmas present should the, should the, uh, the opportunity present itself, we also engage in activities intended to explain that material to a wider public. And, when, and given that the very first volume in that series dealt with the period from 1919 to 1922, and dealt very strongly with the Anglo-Irish Treaty, and given that the particular project I work on, Documents in Irish Foreign Policy, is a partnership between the Academy here, the Department of Foreign Affairs, and the National Archives, where we are physically based, it made sense that we, were going to, um, that we should become involved in the centenary exhibition that the archives um, developed to mark the centenary of the signing of the Anglo-Irish Treaty. And I'm talking to you today because me and my colleagues helped to curate that exhibition. And for those of you who didn't see it, you admit that may look familiar from seeing it in and around Dublin Castle last December. But we produced, we published documentary material um, very often in, in its typed form, the contents of which can be fascinating, you know, and we'll go into, I'll explain a bit more about the project itself later this afternoon, should any of you be here. But how do you present this material to a wider public? In, the way, in, in, in terms of how that was done with this particular exhibition, I want to give you a very brief whistle-stop, I suppose, illustration of some of the things that were included in the exhibition, and give you a sense of how you might take archival documents, which are often kind of humble typescripts, perhaps not, um, not immediately arresting or striking, but how you might frame them in a way that would engage people and make them interesting and explain them. And the way in which it was done with this particular exhibition was not just to, I suppose, put the documents on display, and though they were on display and they formed the core of this exhibition, and the treaty itself formed a centerpiece and, I suppose, conclusion of the exhibition. But the exhibition was also intended to evoke the world in which these documents were generated. And we kind of forget that when we think of the Anglo-Irish Treaty, signed as it was in December, in, on the 6th of December 1921, there can be a tendency to dwell upon one or two aspects of its creation, a tendency to, un, an understandable tendency to dwell upon the, um, the, the, the divisions that flowed from it. But we made a conscious decision with this exhibition that, well, enough people know about the treaty split. Um, and other people were going to argue the toss and explicate that and explain that to a wider public. So we made a very conscious decision that this exhibition was going to stop with the signing of the treaty and we were going to go back. We were going to look at its origins and explain how this uniquely important document came into being. And we did it through, I suppose, a combination. Of, did anyone go to the exhibition? That's the spirit. I like it. Um, just to give you some numbers, about 16,000 people went to see it in Dublin Castle, so some of you can count yourselves among that lucky, that lucky number. Another 7,000 went to see it on its regional tour. Um, about 1,000 people saw it in its preview that was hosted by the British Academy in London this time last year. I don't know how many people got to see it at its last hurrah at the National Ploughing Championships the other week, but you know, I'm, guessing, you know, a few, I'm guessing there was a bit of footfall at that. What we tried to do was kind of put the documents on display. Some of them are, in, some of them are particularly are more striking than others. But we also tried to evoke the world in which those documents were created. Um, what kind of sounds did people hear in, say, the Dublin or London of late 1921? What sights did they see? Um, what, what did they recall? You know, we had a mixture of, say, audio-visual, and we were involved at curating and developing this exhibition at every level. It's the material on display, the text that we wrote, um, also the audio and visual components, you know, dramatizations of people's recollections of being in London, photographs of their journey there, and what you're looking at behind us is a photograph from the National Library of Ireland that shows the mailboat Kirkmore leaving what was then Dunleary, well, actually, it was Dunleary, still is Dunleary, I always get that little the Kingstown Dunleary thing mixed up, I forget the date, though we should remember it, but leaving Dunleary Harbour, carrying the delegation that went over to sign the treaty. Now, as, in terms of the delegation, there is a tendency to dwell upon the five men who negotiated it, and two men in particular. What we forget, though, is that the delegation was much, much wider than that. And we wanted to kind of bring some hidden lives out into the, uh, 
out into the open as well. As part of the decade of centenaries, there's been a huge contribution, or a huge emphasis on the contribution of women to the independence struggle. Well, the point was made early on that without the role of women, so as support staff, and uh, the secretariat that kind of operated with the delegation in London, none of the material in that exhibition would exist because they were the ones that typed it. Michael Collins did not sit down at a typewriter, you know. You know, Arthur Griffith did not sit down, at, sit down at a typewriter. But people like Kathleen Napoli McKenna, you know, Lily O'Brennan, you know, pictured here with Arthur Griffith, they sat down and they would have dealt it, and these were trusted, reliable people. Napoli McKenna in particular left a fascinating account of life in London, and she had played an integral role in the propaganda machine of Sinn Féin in Dublin as a person who edited and very often wrote up the Dolls, you know, pr propaganda bulletin, the Irish bulletin in 1919, 20 and 21. In terms of, say, the wider world in which they operated, these, and these material, this is material from the National Archives, we wouldn't normally publish this stuff, but it's perfect to put on display because of how visually striking it is. On the right, you see a copy of the aforementioned Irish Bulletin in German, published in Germany, dated the 12th of October, and talking about the arrival of the Irish delegation to negotiate the treaty in London, which, and the treaty negotiations began the previous day. On the right, a letter dated the same date from the, from the Irish Self-Determination League of Great Britain, the main Irish kind of separatist organisation in Great Britain at that time, and apparently the largest Irish organisation ever created in Britain. Um, now, in terms of that state illustrate, I suppose the photo shows a bit of the journey. The two documents prior to that show a bit of the reaction to that journey. These show some of the nuts and bolts. Over here, you know, we, 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 we love this invoice. You get some great letterheads on these old documents, you know, they're, they're great to see, you know, it's great artistry goes into these things. So you have basically, it's, um, it's an invoice for basically doing up the offices that they were going to use in, in London. They had to rent two townhouses, you know, to base themselves in. And this was a delegation of a, at least over 30 people. People came and went, but as I said, far more than just the five people who were sitting in the negotiating room with the British negotiators. This is always a good one because it's an invoice for the rental of Rolls-Royce cars. We kind of forget that, um, you know, the doll viewed itself as a government in waiting. You know, that was their position on the matter, that, you know, they were a republic, they were an elected government with a mandate. And if you're a government, you want to rock up in style to number 10 Downing Street. You're not going to get a taxi. You're not going to go up on foot. You were going to want to turn up in a Rolls Royce and present yourself to the world as best you could. And people kind of, people got that one. In fact, the and the dates here show... Um, it actually comes down to the 10th, the 9th, the 7th, 8th, 9th. These are being rented all throughout, the, throughout the, the course of negotiations in October and November. And those little human details, if you match that with a photograph of the same car, and you can identify the same car via the registration plates, you know, you evoke that sense of the world. You had a great photograph, you know, of the car, one of the cars coming out of Downing Street, past crowds of well-wishers, and match it up to that document, you know. It kind of, it, it conjures up something. something. That's the wider delegation, um, missing a couple of its key figures, but it indicates you don't see, you see Arthur Griffith there, you don't see Collins there, you see many other familiar faces there, and many unfamiliar faces there as well, you know, some of whom went on to have rather curious careers. I mean, the guy over here on the very far, on the far left, sitting down, Joseph McGrath, is probably best known to Irish history as the man who created the Irish hospital sweepstakes, but that lay in the future. Um, but the point is that far more people were involved in you know, navigating those discussions and creating that treaty than just the people whose names appear on it. It's a point I'm laboring, but it's a point we really wanted to get across as we kind of brought this, this exhibition into, into, uh, into, into being. Picture of Michael Collins, and that's a picture I took in London last year. Collins is standing on that balcony. Okay, that's 22 Hands Place, one of the two townhouses in Kensington and Chelsea, because remember, you wanted to do this in style, so you'd weren't, you were going to rent a house in somewhere plush. These were used at the delegation headquarters, you know, there they fat the offices, because bear in mind, the British had the advantage of these negotiations taking place on their own territory, on their own, with the, with the benefit and support of their own bureaucracy, but that's one of the townhouses that, um, that they would have stayed in, you know, and there's some fascinating descriptions of life in that townhouse that we used. There's a great story that Kathleen Napoli McKenna relates of how uh, they decided to have a party one time to blow off steam. They were under pressure. You know, so a bit of recreation was allowed. And it culminated in Collins and other members of the IRB and the IRA having a food fight and throwing lumps of coal at one another. You know, um, yeah, these things happen, I suppose. Collins, again, outside one of the other offices, 15 Cadogan Gardens, now a school not too far from Hans Place. You know, and it's fascinating to walk those streets last year and kind of track down those buildings. You know, the same stonework being visible, the same structures that survive today as existed 100 years ago and as reflected in photographs from that time. Collins and Griffith leaving number 10 Downing Street. Um, on the far left, Emma Dalton, in later life, one of the founders of Ardmore Studios. 
present at the deaths of both Michael Collins and Thomas Kettle at the Battle of the Somme in 1916. And again, another little story that lurked behind us. The, the reality of the treaty negotiations. And one role that Dalton had in the course of those negotiations was buying a plane using the IRA's money to ensure a swift getaway from London should negotiations collapse. And the plane was never used for the purpose, but later became the first aircraft used by the nascent Irish Air Corps in 1923, nicknamed the big fella after Collins, who was originally meant to transport. You can't really have one side without the other. Okay, at least two of those British negotiators are clearly identifiable, most obviously probably to an Irish audience, Winston Churchill, David Lloyd George, the incumbent Liberal Prime Minister, um, and in the background, F.E. Smith, Lord Birkenhead, Lord Chancellor. So probably the three key figures on the British side. And it was a great document that's, um, that to me showed history in the making, which is a draft of the treaty where um, in Birkenhead's writing, he had crossed something out. I mean, throughout, the British wanted a settlement. They wanted an agreement. And while well, they had certain red lines to use parlance of our times, they were clear that they were willing to soften some of the language they could use. So in the discussion of the oath that was to be sworn by parliamentarians in the Irish Free State, the original draft said the British Empire. Now, the Irish delegation objected to this, and in Birkenhead's handwriting, you can see how empire has been crossed out and British Commonwealth of Nations has been placed in. That's significant because the first legal and official use of the term British Commonwealth is in Article 4 of the Anglo-Irish Treaty of 1921. So you can quite literally imagine a room in which history was being made in a way that would have profound implications for the British Empire over the course of its remaining existence. Now, back to the paperwork. Over here, minutes of the first meeting, the official minutes of the first meeting between the two delegations in Number 10 Downing Street. There was a conundrum at the start of the talks because for many of the British negotiators, they were dealing with people they viewed as murderers. So the idea of shaking hands at Michael Collins was a bit of a problem. They got around it by basically assembling on either side of the cabinet table in the cabinet room of Downing Street. Lloyd George came around and shook the hands of the Irish negotiators, thereby sparing his colleagues what they may have viewed as an uncomfortable indignity. Handshakes all around would have to wait until the treaty was actually signed. Over here, Eamon de, a letter from Arthur Griffith, handwritten to Eamon de Valera, giving because Eamon de Valera famously or infamously was not part of that delegation. But you realise that there's a whole... Um, there's a lot of meetings that weren't recorded on the British side that were recorded on the, on the Irish side because you had to keep de Valera informed. So people were writing back to Dublin with reports of those meetings. And even in this letter, Griffith is pointing out that, you know, the two big issues and identifying the two big issues that would loom large in, in the negotiation of the treaty, partition and Ireland's relationship to the, Brit to the British Empire. There's no photograph of the negotiations of progress, but in the papers of Robert Barton, and Barton is down here in the far right corner, that's from the Illustrated London News, lovingly conserved by the conservation staff at the National Archives, and I will always make the point that whenever you see historians talk about the past, there is an army of archivists and conservators that, lay beh that lie behind them to make sure that material exists and is presentable. That's from the Illustrated London News, a stylized depiction of the talks in progress as they wound towards their end in, throughout November 1921. I mentioned the Irish Self-Determination League of Great Britain. Well, they organised a concert, you know, for the delegation in the Albert Hall on, um, in October 19, 1921. You know, a big, you know, celebration of Irish life in London with over about, with about 5,000 people in attendance. And there's a little coda about that that I'll come to in a moment. Other ephemera. A sketch by Robert Barton that was almost certainly done for um, Frank Packenham, later Lord Longford, as he wrote an account of the treaty negotiations in the early 1930s, the cabinet table for some of the negotiations. Partition. Partition was of fundamental importance to those negotiations. Just because partition didn't loom large in the treaty split that came later, you shouldn't underestimate the extent to which partition and the prospect of Irish unity, or lack thereof, played the role that played within the treaty negotiations itself. Last but not least, the documents. Now, there are two copies of the Anglo-Irish Treaty. There's the Irish one which is held in, national, in the National Archives. There's the British one that's held in the, in the National Archives in Kew. Well, when I say National Archives, I mean the ones up in Bishop Street, not the ones in Kew. But there's two copies. And there's a little distinction that brings us back to one of the documents I showed up before, the, the ticket to the event in the Royal Albert Hall, because the signatures are different. On the Irish copy, you have the Irish signatures on the, on the left, British on the right. It's reversed in the British copy. But there was a problem, because when, they were, when the treaty was famously signed, and admittedly signed under duress in the early hours of the 6th of December 1921, it was only signed by three people on both sides, because only three people on either side were at the actual final meeting. So you had to get the rest of the signatures. Kathleen Napoli McKenna recalled how um, Eamon Duggan later signed a document in 22 hands place with a cigarette in his mouth. You know, as he signed it. You know, you know we're lucky there's not a cigarette burn in the thing. Um, and Duggan, that morning, 
I mean, I presume he put out a cigarette, went to bed, because he had to be upright and early, because he had the job of bringing that document to Dublin to present it to Eamon de Valera for his consideration. Now, the catch was, when the British began looking for the signatures for their copy, they sent an emissary round to the Irish delegation's offices the next afternoon to be confronted with the fact that Eamon Duggan was no longer there. So it was suggested that somebody could sign in his stead, but then somebody realised that at that event in the Albert Hall, that one right there, the treaty delegates had signed loads of copies of programmes. You know, they had autographed these things, and there were a few of them knocking around, and someone realised that we actually have Duggan's signature here. We just have to cut it out and paste it onto the original, onto the British copy. And you can see how, in the British copy, second name down on the right-hand column, you can see the outline of how it was pasted on, and that was the copy issued to the press. That is the copy that you will see in contemporary newspapers, which were reproduced in that exhibition. That's the one that actually was of significant, was seen as significant enough to push a message from the, from the then US President Warren Harding off the front page of the New York Times, you know? And then we stopped their exhibition, and others could argue the point about the split. Why am I telling you all this? Well, there's two reasons. If you wanted to um, find out more about the intricacies of the treaty negotiations, they're replicated in Documents in Irish Foreign Policy, Volume 1, and you can peruse a few copies of that outside. But it's also an indication of outreach. It's a reflection of the partnership that you know, our particular project has with a, nas with a national cultural institution, and what one can do to reach an audience when the resources are there and the willingness to do it is there. Because while there is a place for specialised scholarship, undoubtedly, there is also a place for communicating that scholarship to the widest possible audience, and we view ourselves as public servants, and that is part of our brief. Now, for many of you, I think people will encounter um, the work of the Royal Irish Academy through the outputs of its research projects, its publications, its library, which we would have passed through to come into this newly renovated and beautifully renovated meeting room here today. What I've given you is one sense, I suppose, or tried to give you one indication of one activity that one project in this institution took part in, um, an indication of how you might approach it, how you might reach an audience, and also to reiterate the fact that this reached an audience, that there is an audience out there who were interested in the past, the culturally curious, as Board Falch might necessarily say, um, and this is one way in which we saw, we kind of were involved in getting their attention and explaining the past to them um, over the course of the past year. Now, in terms of what the project actually does, I have another slot later on this afternoon. If you are still here, we can get into the nuts and bolts of actually producing those nice, green, handsome volumes. But in the meantime, I'm going to stop there. I would thank you for your time. Enjoy your morning. And we are here to answer your questions on anything relating to the projects operated through the Academy in the rooms outside. Thank you, and enjoy the rest of your day.